Today we begin Kurt Vonnegut's Slaughterhouse Five. The theme for this first video, or first part of the video at least, is Slaughterhouse Five as postmodern novel. With Vonnegut's novel, we can begin seriously talking about the transition from post from modernism to postmodernism. But defining postmodernism has been a problem ever since it began, so we have to ask ourselves what it means. Uh, modernism, as we have seen earlier in the year, was influenced greatly by the First World War's turbulent overthrow of traditional values, and thus presents a shattered, fragmented perception of society. But it has as a goal the representation of a system of sorts, an alternative way of presenting reality, even if in only an aesthetic way. Postmodernism, on the other hand, undercuts the idea of replacing the shattered system and values with something else. It decenters modernism's structural integrity. Postmodern theory is decidedly cerebral. I mean, try reading some of the more significant works of Derrida and Foucault, for example. And many postmodern novels are also obtuse and mockingly academic. Um, one of my favorites, Thomas Pynchon, for example, and some uh, of the works of Vladimir Nabokov. Um, those are ones that are mockingly academic in some ways. But other, and other, other novelists tend toward a more lowbrow or derivative form of fiction. Uh, Pynchon, even though he is very um, obtuse in many ways, he's also fond of inserting pop music lyrics uh, into his novels. Um, and others incorporate elements of television or cartoons or, in uh, Vonnegut's case, science fiction. Let, for the sake of convenience, let me refer you to a paragraph from a glossary of literary terms by M. H. Abrams, a reference book I often consult for terms like this. I've posted it on the Course Connect page. Go to the link called Postmodernism, which will take you to a rather long entry from this book with the title Modernism and Postmodernism. I've marked up a paragraph near the end that begins, quote, the term postmodernism. And let me read a little bit of that to you. Postmodernism involves not only a continuation, sometimes carried to an extreme, of the counter-traditional experiments of modernism, but also diverse attempts to break away from the modernist forms which had inevitably become in their turn conventional, as well as to the overthrow of elitism of modernist high art by recourse to the models of, quote, mass culture in film, television, newspaper cartoons, and popular music. Many of the works of postmodern literature so blend literary genres, cultural and stylistic levels, the serious and the playful, that they resist classification according to the traditional li literary rubrics. So Slaughterhouse Five is in this cat latter category, an imitation or parody of a lowbrow piece of popular fiction that doesn't take itself very seriously. But it's very important to know that this is just an illusion. This is a very sophisticated novel, um, but it, it's a device. Uh, Vonnegut presents to the reader what he, or his narrator, says is an attempt at a war book to account for his war experience. He fails, he says. What, has he in, ha, what he has instead is a book about the impossibility of accounting for the bombing of Dresden, World War II, war in general. I'm going to read uh, just a brief section from page 24. It is, he, not, not, Vonnegut talks about his novel. He says, it is so short and jumbled and jangled, Sam, because there is nothing intelligent to say about a massacre. Everybody is supposed to be dead, to never say anything or want anything ever again. Everything is supposed to be very quiet after a massacre, and it always is, except for the birds. And what do the birds say? All there is to say about a massacre, things like, pooty wheat. So chapter one and the novel as a whole end with this sound of the birds, pooty wheat, as a way of saying, in short, WTF. Um, so what does there say about disaster with this? All 
right, so here are some of the ways in which Slaughterhouse-Five demonstrates uh, qualities of the postmodern novel. It continues uh, counter-traditional elements. This is uh, something that was mentioned in that handout I was talking about. In, uh, and so in what ways does it frustrate or disarm the reader's expectation? Well, I mean, the fact that he calls it a failure. You know, we're supposed to be reading a book uh, that, about a famous uh, horrible event, and he calls the book a failure. Uh, he, the choice of protagonist, Billy Pilgrim, is a really odd choice. The back and forth in, in time. So these are very experimental, experimental types of things. It also breaks with the elitism of many modernist works. It doesn't require prior knowledge of things like Joyce and Eliot. Uh, it draws from lowbrow cultural elements like science fiction, limericks and other silly rhymes, pooty wheat, and especially so it goes. It breaks the frame of what separates the fictional world from the real world. There's a very um, um, famous uh, scene where uh, Vonnegut, as a soldier uh, in the prison or prisoner of war camp, is in the latrine, uh, and you know, he says, that was me, that was I, that was the author of this book. Um, and then finally, a meta discourse. This is different and perhaps harder to see than some postmodern text. But the self-conscious commentary on his writing of the book, the commentary on time, uh, on Trafalgar, the quotes from books, he has a, a lot of quotes from, from obscure books. So these are all uh, qualities of the postmodern novel. Let's look at the title page. This is a great place to get a sense of the very irreverent, humorous way Vonnegut deals with a very serious subject. So there's the title, and there are you know a couple of uh, of um, subtitles uh, and, the, and the author's description. I mean, you read these, and you're like, this guy's not being very serious. He's, he's, they appear as as uh, jokes, but Vonnegut provides explanations of the. Uh, of the subtitles uh, in ch chapter one or other places. And so these are devices that have been used in um, novels in, in previous periods, the idea of having subtitles and having you know, authors' descriptions of the book. Um, so he's, he's borrowing them, he's parodying them. They come across as jokes and they undercut the expectations we bring as readers to a book that's supposed to be about something very serious. He has a dedication, which is I'm not going to show you here, uh, but it, he explains this uh, too in chapter uh, in chapter one um, why he is um, dedicating the book to Mary O'Hare and Gunther uh, Miller. Miller. There's an, also an epigraph, which is the the lyrics from Away in a Manger, which seems really bizarre. But then at the beginning of chapter one. All this happened, more or less. He continues to undercut expectations. The book is presented as being an autobiographical, historical um, um, book uh, uh, on a very serious and famous disaster. But then all this happened, more or less. Um, the war parts, anyway, are pretty much true. Um, so again, he's, he continues to undercut expectations. And in, in addition to undercutting reader expectations about the subject matter, Vonnegut also undercuts himself. If we were in the classroom now, this is where I would usually try to get some discussion going about how the author represents himself, especially in the first chapter. The author also happens to be the narrator, and this is another way that uh, Vonnegut breaks the rules of literary conventions. But how does he depict himself? We've already mentioned that he says his book, he and his book, are failures. And then he tells us about his habit of drinking late at night and calling old girlfriends. He tells us of his chats with his dog Sandy. And he refers to himself as an old fart with his memories in his Pall Malls. So the author is self-deprecating. Um, but what are his intentions in doing so? Um, this is a question maybe left, better left to the end of our treatment of the novel or for a paper topic, uh, or an essay or discussion board topic. 
So chapter one has a, I mean, the book has a really odd arrangement. Chapter one is more like a prologue, and the last chapter more like an epilogue, but he doesn't call them that. Uh, in the first chapter and the last chapter, it's, it's Vonnegut telling us about himself, not telling the story about Billy Pilgrim. So who is talking? Yes, Vonnegut, the person, the author trying to write the war book. Um, is this the same person as, who is the narrator? Apparently so. Um, another way that uh, Vonnegut, I mean, usually in a literature class, you'd always say that the narrator is never to be considered the voice of the author. And here he's doing it that way. So, and also, but why use Billy as his protagonist instead of himself? Um, Billy, who was, uh, you know, insane. Also, in, in creating a kind of third-person narrator, he also has intimate knowledge of Billy's thoughts um, um, and his past, etc. So um, that's kind of an odd thing, too. How does Kurt Vonnegut, the person, have that sort of omniscience that a narrator would have? How is the narrator like Billy? How is he different? I think the, cha the, the end of chapter one is particularly significant. In that, while Vonnegut continually undercuts himself and does not seem to be telling a, telling a horrible story very seriously, he reveals a lot in his reference to Lot's wife. I've posted a link to the Bible story of Sodom and Gomorrah on the Course Connect page, if you're not familiar with it. God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah because of the sinfulness of the inhabitants but allows Lot and his immediate family to escape. This is a parallel to the, to the destruction of Dresden, the whole city wiped out in a flash. Vonnegut, like Lot's wife, escapes the inferno, but cannot help but to look back with sorrow. He calls himself a pillar of salt. So this one is a failure um, because it was written by a pillar of salt. Um, so he, he equates himself with Lot's wife. Uh, but he, he calling himself a pillar of salt, it's as if, he, as if the experience of seeing the destruction has made him unable to feel like a, like a statue. Uh, a couple times in the book, a character says, why me? In, in Vonnegut's letters about the war, he continually asks himself the question, well, why me? How fate allowed him to live when so many died. So I kind of think about that for a second. So um, one last thing I'd like you to be thinking about before, before moving on is, is there value to taking the novel apart and reconstructing Billy's life experience to see if it provides some insight? The novel is told in fragments with all of Billy's time travel. It can be difficult to follow, but think about the chronology of events. It may help us to figure out how Billy got to, to be the way he is and how the story of the trial of Amadorians came about. And we're going to come back and talk about those trial of Amadorians in a little while. Um, but um, I wanted to switch gears here. The, the next part of this video is, um, uh, the first one was um, uh, Slaughterhouse-Five as postmodern novel. I'd like to start talking no now about, um, about Slaughterhouse-Five as a satire. Uh, and, you know, usually um, in the classroom, at least, you know, at this point is where I kind of ask for open it up for a classroom discussion. And I ask the question, um, if Vonnegut's intention is to write an anti-war novel, why doesn't he just seriously present arguments against war? Um, why not be more direct? And, and usually it doesn't take long for students to say, well, it's satire. Well, why, why satire? And... Um, you know, typically, you know, it doesn't take long for people to say, well, uh, satire, people use satire because we remember the message. So satire is having, a, is, a, is, a, is a comic, a uh, humorous piece, whether it's a, a book or a film or whatever, um, that has a serious message. Okay, so then why not just give the serious message? When people laugh at something, they tend to remember it better. It makes a bigger impression. And so that doesn't, you know, take a lot of time to, we, we get that, you know, we, we, when, when we get the joke, um, we see both um, the funniness of it, but also the seriousness of it. And this is what 
uh, Vonnegut seems to be particularly um, good at. All right, so um, yeah, let's um, talk about the Trophonadorians uh, a bit and what their role is in this novel. Who are they and what is their role? First, let's look at a description uh, of them in, um, in the book. Um, this is on pages 33 and 34. Um, <clears throat> so the letter said that they were two feet high and green and shaped like plumber's friends. That is a plunger, okay, if you don't know what that, that is. Their suction cups were on the ground and their shafts, which were extremely flexible, usually pointed to the sky. At the top of each shaft was a little hand with a, with a green eye in its palm. The creatures were friendly, and they could see in four dimensions. They pitied earthlings for being able to see only three. They had many wonderful things to teach earthlings, especially about time. Billy promised to tell what some of those wonderful things were in his next letter. I usually like to include this picture. I usually will show it in class, and I think it's posted on the Course Connect page, too, but... Here's an artist's rendering of what the Trophonadorians uh, uh, look like. Um, and I'm remembering um, the, a passage I was just reading um, earlier today <clears throat> where um, they're uh, asking Billy questions. Or the, he's on, on display at the zoo. Um, and um, when B Billy says something stupid, I think he said what they think is stupid, it says that they all put their close their hands over their one eye. And so that image of them, like, just kind of like, Billy just said something stupid. It just kind of stands out in my head. So this is what they look like. The fact that they experience the world in four dimensions is a significant thing that we'll probably come back to later on. But uh, the way they explain it is that they see, they, um, one of them explains to Billy that he says, try to imagine um, you're looking at the whole of the Grand Canyon um, or, or mountain range. And that, uh, so all of that is, is time. Uh, with the Trophomodorians are able to see all of time at once. And so, and this is what uh, the, the explanation to give about uh, why you know, death does not bother uh, them so much is that they, they see all of time and they can kind of pick and choose moments. Here is a really interesting detail about the Trophomadorians. In this passage uh, where they are introduced the idea of their books, I mean, Billy is, a, is their prisoner. He's uh, being held there, uh, but they you know, treat him very nicely. Uh, he asks if they have any books to read because he's kind of bored, and they give him the Valley of the Dolls, which is kind of an interesting choice. Um, I don't know if anybody, any of you know this book, but um, it supposedly has a lot of uh, sex in it. So when he is talking about the book with all its ups and downs, ups and downs, um, and that's kind of a, a veiled allusion to all the sex that's in the book. Um, but um, anyway, uh, Billy gets bored with that after a while, and he says, well, don't you have anything else to read? And they say, well, they only have Trafalmadoria novels which I'm afraid you couldn't begin to understand. And so Billy says, let me look at one anyway. So look at the description here down below. Billy couldn't read Trafalmadorian, of course, but he could see at least how they were laid out in brief clumps of symbols separated by stars. All right, now, I'm, I'm not, I've been showing you enough of this text, to, and you've been reading enough of this text to, to know that the sections are very short. The chapters are, are longish, but there are lots of sections. And they're all separated by, well, it looks like three dots here, but if you look closely at the book, they do look more like stars on the edges. Um, so what, what does that mean? You know, that means that this, um, this book, not Vonnegut's book, is trying to present itself as a, a Trafalmadorian um, novel. All right, so here's another um, interesting detail that... Um, um, that is connected to this. I'm not, not going to read this whole passage to you or anything, but this is the place where Billy is waiting for to be abducted by the Trafalmadorians. He probably uh, knows that they're they're uh, coming in, in advance. So he's kind of waiting for them. And so he proceeds to watch um, a movie, uh, both 
forwards and backwards. And um, and it's a war movie, and it's 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 a war movie that's showing you know like a like a bombing, except now when he when he uh, shows the film backwards, where he watches the film backwards, look at the way he's you know how the, the the airplanes American planes full of holes and wounded men and corpses took off backwards from the airfield in England um, over France, a few German fighters. I think is coming backwards, but look at how all the details he works in here when the bombers got back. Through the, through the base, the steel cylinders, the bombs were taken from the racks and shipped back to the United States of America where factories and were operating night and day, dismantling cylinders, separating the dangerous contents into minerals. Touchingly, it was mainly women who did this work. The minerals were then shipped um, to specialists in remote areas. It was their business to put them into the ground, to hide them cleverly so they would never hurt anybody again. Uh, and the American Flyers turned in their uniforms and uh, became high school kids. So, yeah, so what do we got going on here then? Uh, this is this is similar to what a Trafalgar novel um, does in, in using and manipulating time so that, you know, you can you can retell the story and not see the um, the outcome as being a destruction and death, but um, you know, putting like a, a, a happy spin on it. So, um, Slaughterhouse Five then becomes something like a Trafalgarian novel. It goes back and forth in time, not dwelling on death. And then this is why the Trafalgarians say uh, so it goes, and so this is why uh, Vonnegut keeps repeating that every time a death is mentioned in the book, every single time in his book, um, even ants or even the champagne uh, was dead. So it goes. Um, so this is kind of a constant reminder that this is a device that is imitating the Trafalgarian um, novels. Um, one other uh, particularly interesting detail on pages 148 and to 50, and I, so since it's several pages long here, I don't, have a, I don't have a slide of it, but we find out that the Trafalgarians um, are responsible for the eventual destruction of the universe. It was an accident. Um, what might be the significance of this as a hum human and earthling existence? Um, guilt, conscience lead to the avoidance of thinking about that. This could be, in you know, Vonnegut's way, he creates the Trafalgarians to represent people who are so feel so guilty about the destruction of the universe um, that they create this fourth dimension to alleviate that guilt. Guilt. I don't know. Does that make sense to people? Uh, it's a really. Uh, I mean, one of the things that makes this novel, I think, so um, so clever and so ingenious. Before ending this video, uh, I would like to return to the question of um, Billy's character and um, if we are able to put together a chronology of events, uh, would that help inform our understanding of the novel and his character? And I am working on um, uh, a document. I mean, I have an old document that's a chronology, but it's all, it's a, a hard copy that's all marked up. So I'm trying to work on um, um, a new document that it develops uh, the chronology and, and, and might uh, provide some, some um, uh, material for further discussion later in time. But, you know, uh, one of the things we want to think about with, with Billy, you know, did, Billy Pilgrim was certainly damaged um, by World War II. Um, but did, did he have enough trauma in his life before the war to, to suggest that he may already have been losing it even without the war experience? I mean, I think so. His father was shot in a hunting accident. Um, you know, shot and killed, and he had to come back from um, military training to see to go to his funeral. But besides that, uh, he, you know, he was thrown in, into a pool of water to learn how to swim by his father. Uh, his family went to the Grand Canyon where he was afraid he was going to fall in. Uh, uh, he's his mother has this giant crucifix in the house that is really bloody. You know, so he seems to have been a very sensitive soul from the very beginning. Um, and then also in, in his basic training, you know, he is a chaplain's assistant with beliefs about Jesus that the book says other soldiers found putrid. It's on page 38, if anybody wants to look it up. Um, 
Has he been singled out as being someone who's really not fit for combat? Uh, or is he perhaps a conscientious objector or uh, something like that? But uh, I think it is pretty clear that it's not just the war experience that, that made Billy um, um, different. Um, he was already um, sort of uh, damaged or, or uh, challenged, I guess, in a way. But the war certainly had a really terrible effect as well. All right, so um, that's it for now, and uh, you'll be hearing from me again on what the, what we'll cover next with this book. Um, so hope you're enjoying it. Hope you're uh, staying um, safe and healthy during this uh, trying time. So we'll talk to you later.